Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to do a practice problem set that relates to our spectroscopy lecture. Please make sure to watch the lectures before you tackle the problems. Let's go ahead and get started. Problem 1 says IR spectroscopy is the most useful for distinguishing blank. A says double and triple bonds, B says carbon and hydrogen bonds, C says chirality of molecules, and D says relative percentage of enantiomers in mixtures. Now, when we talked about infrared spectroscopy, we said it is the most useful for distinguishing between different functional groups. Now, almost all organic compounds have carbon-hydrogen bonds, so except for the fingerprint region of a compound, these absorptions are not so useful. No, not little information um, about the optical properties of a compound can be obtained by IR spectroscopy. So those two facts alone allow us to cancel out a couple of answer choices here. All right, it is not the most useful, useful for distinguishing carbon-hydrogen bonds. If you are concerned about the carbon-hydrogen framework of a molecule, an unknown molecule, NMR would be extremely useful for that. It doesn't tell us about anything about the chirality of molecules or the relative percentages of enantiomers in a mixture, a uh, polarimeter might be more useful for something like that, especially for relative percentage of enantiomer mixtures. This leaves us with answer choice A. Infrared spectroscopy is the most useful for distinguishing double and triple bonds. And if you remember from our lecture, we are very concerned about the diagnostic region. That is what we worry ourselves for the MCAT and also in most organic chemistry classes as well. And you realize that in this diagnostic region you can learn a lot about double bonds and triple bonds so it is the most useful for distinguishing double and triple bonds one is a now two says oxygen does not exhibit exhibit an ir spectrum because blank a it has no molecular motions b it is not possible to record ir spectra of a gaseous molecule c molecular vibrations do not result in a change in the dipole moment or d Molecular oxygen contains four lone pairs overall. Now, because molecular oxygen, so O2, is homonuclear, it's only composed of one element, that's oxygen, you guessed it, and it's diatomic, there is no net change in the dipole moment during vibration or rotation. So in other words, this compound does not absorb in a measurable way in the infrared region. Now, if you remember from our lecture, we said IR spectra is based on the principle that when the molecule vibrates or rotates, there is a change in the dipole moment. For O2, we're not going to see that. Molecular vibrations do not result in a change in the dipole moment. So the correct answer for two here is going to be C. Choice A is incorrect because oxygen does does have molecular motions, they're just not detectable in IR spectroscopy. B is also incorrect because it is possible, it is possible to record the IR of a gaseous molecule as long as it shows a change in the dipole moment when it vibrates. And answer choice D is also incorrect because lone pairs do not have an effect on the ability to generate an IR spectrum of a compound. So for two, the correct answer is C. Fantastic. Three says, if IR spectroscopy were employed to monitor the oxidation of benzyl alcohol to benzaldehyde, which of the following would provide the best evidence that the reaction was proceeding as planned? So I have drawn for us benzyl alcohol all right, so this R is a benzene group, benzyl alcohol to benzaldehyde. Here, R is that benzyl group, all right? Now, if we look at these two molecules, what we notice is that the functional group is changing. The functional group is changing from a hydroxyl to an aldehyde. This means that a sharp peak will appear around 1700, 1750, which corresponds to this carbonyl group based off of our chart that we were supposed, that we should memorize about useful signals in the dia diagnostic region we should be familiar with, all right? So what we're looking for here is that one good evidence, the best evidence that this reaction is proceeding is that there should be an emergence of a feature around 17 
50, all right, a sharp peak that will appear around 1750, which corresponds to this carbonyl group. All right, now let's look at these answer choices. All right, answer choice A says comparing the fingerprint region of the spectra of the starting material and product. This is not going to be very useful at all. All right, this is not the answer that we're looking for. We're looking for the best evidence that the reaction is going to proceed as planned. Comparing the fingerprint regions will provide evidence that a reaction is occurring, but it's not as useful for knowing that the reaction uh, that occurred was indeed the one that was desired. All right, B says, noting the change in intensity of the peaks corresponding to the benzene ring. This is also not a useful way. All right, there's benzene rings in both of these molecules. That's what the R group here is. So that's not the dominant thing that you should be looking for to say that your reaction is proceeding as planned. C says, noting the appearance of a broad absorption peak in the region 31 to 3500. Choice C is actually the opposite of what occurs. The reaction is going to be characterized by the disappearance of the OH peak, feature, peak feature that appears at 31 to 3500. This feature should disappear if the reaction is proceeding forward. So C is incorrect. The opposite should be happening. D says, noting the appearance of a strong absorption in the region of 1750. This is the correct answer. If we begin to see the uh, appearance of a strong absorption in the region of 1750, this indicates this carbonyl functionality, which is what should happen if this reaction is proceeding forward. So three is D. Four says, which of the following chemical shifts would correspond to an aldehyde protein signal in HNMR spectra? Great question. So this is, this is important for us to know where the aldehyde feature is going to appear. The peak at 9.5 ppm, it corresponds to an aldehydic proton. This signal, it lies downfield because the carbonyl oxygen is electron withdrawing and it de-shields the proton. So the correct answer is A. Now, if we look at the answer choices, choice B, 7 ppm, this corresponds to aromatic protons. All right, this is a good thing for you to know. This corresponds to aromatic protons. Answer choice T, C, I'm so sorry. Answer choice C corresponds to a carboxyl proton and is even further downfield because the acidic proton is deshielded to a greater degree than the al the aldehyde proton. All right, so this is for carboxylic acid. And then D is characteristic of an alkyl proton on an sp3 hybridized uh, carbon. And so the answer choice for four is going to be A. Five says the isotope of carbon 12 is not useful for NMR because blank. A says it is not abundant in nature. C, B says its resonants are not sensitive to the presence of neighboring atoms. C says it has no magnetic moment. And D says it, the signal to noise ratio in the spectrum is too low. All right. Now, five. Okay. The isotope here, carbon-12. Let's think about this. This isotope, it has no magnetic moment. All right. And it will therefore not exhibit resonance with an applied magnetic field. Remember, nuclei with odd mass numbers, so hydrogen 1, carbon 13, nitrogen 15, all right, and so on, or those with an even mass number but an odd atomic number like hydrogen 2, all right, will have a non-zero magnetic moment. But carbon 12, it has no magnetic moment. It is not that it's not abundant in nature. That is the actual abundant isotope of carbon in nature. It has nothing to do with resonances not being sensitive to the presence of neighboring atoms or anything to do with signal to noise ratio here. It is because simply it has no magnetic moment. So five is C. All right. Five is C. Six says, in HNMR, splitting of spectral lines is due to blank. A says coupling between a carbon atom and protons attached to that carbon atom. B says coupling between carbon atom and protons attached to adjacent carbon atoms. C says coupling between adjacent carbon atoms. And D says coupling between protons on adjacent carbon atoms. Now, spin-spin coupling or splitting, if you remember from our lecture, it's due to the influence 
on the magnetic environment of one proton by protons on the adjacent atom. These protons are about three bonds away from each other and splitting uh, and, and the splitting is caused by those neighboring protons and their magnetic moments and fields. And so here, if we look at the answer choices, the answer choice that makes the most sense is going to be D, coupling between protons on adjacent carbon atoms. That is literally how we defined splitting and multiplicity. All right, so this is simply a definition question, making sure you understand how we defined splitting of the NMR peaks and multiplicity. So six is D. Seven says, compared to IR and NMR spectroscopy, UV spectroscopy is preferred for detecting blank. A says aldehydes and ketones. B says unconjugated alkenes. C says conjugated alkenes. And D says aliphatic acids and amines. Now, if you remember, this was one of the, the selling points for UV is that we said it was for conjugated alkenes. Most conjugated alkenes have an intense ultraviolet absorption. All right, aldehydes, ketones, acids, and amines, like they're mentioned in answer choices A, B, and D, all absorb in the ultraviolet range. However, other forms of spectroscopy like IR and NMR are more useful for precise identification. And isolated uh, um, alkenes, which is answer choice B, they can rarely, by the way, be identified by UV spectroscopy. So aldehydes, ketones, aliphatic acids, and amines, they could, they absorb an ultraviolet range, but again, other forms of spectroscopy are more useful. And then isolated alkenes altogether here in answer choice B, rarely identified by UV spectroscopy. The selling point, in short, for UV spectroscopy is that it's really useful for conjugated molecules, like conjugated alkenes. So the correct answer for seven is C. Beautiful. Eight says, considering only the 0 to 4.5 ppm region of HNMR spectrum, how could ethanol and isopropanol be distinguished? So I have both molecules drawn out here. All right. Now, the region in question often gives information about the types of alkyl groups present there between 0 and 4.5. Specifically, ethanol. Ethanol will give a characteristic triplet for the methyl group, all right, which is coupled to this CH2, and a quartet for the CH2 group, which is coupled to the methyl group. So what that means is, all right, we have the CH2 group right here in um, ethanol, and we have the CH3 group that's right here. The splitting for CH2, what is it going to be? Well, how many neighboring hydrogens? All right. If we're looking at CH2, how many neighboring hydrogens does it have here at this methyl? There's three hydrogens here. So what is the splitting? The splitting is going to be three hydrogen neighbors plus one. So the splitting for this methyl is going to be, a, for the CH2, is going to be a quartet. Okay, cool. Let me erase this. Let's look at the methyl. All right, let's look at this methyl group now. All right, here's that methyl group. How many neighboring hydrogens does it have? Well, over here is a CH2. There are two hydrogens here. What's the splitting for the methyl then if it has two neighboring hydrogens? It's going to be two plus one, N plus one. Remember our multiplicity rule. And that's equal to three. So at the methyl here, you're going to have a triplet splitting for that methyl feature and a quartet splitting for the CH2 feature. Good. What about for isopropanol? Here is isopropanol. All right, here are the two unique positions for isopropanol. All right, this is a CH group right here. There's only one hydrogen. And this is a methyl group. There are three hydrogens. If we are looking at this position that I am now highlighting in blue, what is going to be the splitting? All right. The splitting is how many neighboring hydrogens does it have? It has three on this side, and it has another three on this side. It has six total hydrogen neighbors, plus one, because n plus one for multiplicity gives us seven. The, the peak splitting for the CH feature is going to be a septet. All right, what about the methyl? This methyl group right here. What is the splitting for this methyl group? Well, how many hydrogen neighbors does it have? Only one right here at the CH group. So one plus one equals two. The splitting for this methyl group is going to be a doublet. All right. 
Keeping all this in mind, we're going to look for an answer choice that says that there's going to be a triplet and quartet observed for ethanol and a doublet and suplet observed for isopropanol because that's going to be what distinguishes the two in this small region of 0 to 4.5 ppm. And the answer choice that exactly says that is going to be answer choice B. So 8 is B. Fantastic. 9 says, before absorbing an ultraviolet photon, electrons can be found in blank. Homo, lumo, both or neither. Well, the homo is going to be the highest occupied molecular orbital. Only after absorbing ultraviolet light is an electron um, excited from the homo to the lumo, which is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. All right. So before absorbing an ultraviolet photon, electrons can be found, all right, in the highest occupied molecular orbital. That's going to be answer choice A. And only after excitation do they go into the LUMO, the lowest occupied molecular orbital. Fantastic. So 9 is A. 10 says, in an IR spectrum, how does extended conjugation of double bonds affect the absorbance band of carbonyl stretches compared with normal absorption? This is a really good problem. Let's think about this. Carbonyl groups in conjugation with double bonds, they tend to absorb at lower wave numbers because the delocalization of pi electrons causes that carbonyl bond to lose double bond character, shifting the frequency closer to a single CO stretch. Remember that high order bonds tend to have higher absorption frequencies, so loss of double bond character should decrease the absorption frequency of the group. So if we're looking at the answer choices here, A says, the absorbance band will occur at lower wavelengths. This is true, all right? That is how extended conjugation of double bonds, that's how it's going to affect the absorbance bond of a carbonyl. It will not occur at higher wave numbers, and it will not occur at the same wave number, and it sure as hell won't just disappear, all right? Carbonyl groups in conjugation with double bonds tend to absorb at lower wave numbers because of the delocalization of pi electrons that cause the carbonyl bond to lose double bond character and shift the stretching frequency closer to the single carbon oxygen stretch. So lower wave numbers. The correct answer for 10 is A. Beautiful. 11 says wave number is directly proportional to blank. Wave number is directly proportional to blank. Now wave number, all right, we talked about this in lecture, is equal to one over wave length. All right, wave number is directly proportional to frequency. Frequency is speed of light over wavelength okay that means the answer is b it is not directly proportional to wavelength it is inversely proportional to wavelength because wave number is one over wavelength all right it is directly proportional to frequency though all right and c and d have nothing to do with wave number there's no proportionality to percent transmittance or absorbance. Those are throwaway answers. And so 11 is B. 12 says two enantiomers will blank. Are they going to have identical IR spectra because they have the same functional groups? Are they going to have identical IR spectra because they have the same specific rotation? Are they going to have different IR spectra because they are structurally different? Or are they going to have different IR spectra because they have different specific rotations? Now, enantiomers are going to have identical IR spectra because guess what? They're going to have the same functional groups and therefore have the same exact absorption frequencies. Enantiomers do have opposite specific rotations, but you're not going to be able to detect that or distinguish that on an IR spectrum. All right. So the correct answer here is going to be A. They're going to have identical IR spectra because they have the same functional groups. All right. Especially when you're looking at your diagnostic region. Fantastic. 13. In a molecule containing a carboxylic acid group, what would we expect in HNMR spectra? All right. The oxygen 
of the hydroxyl group, all right, it's going to de-shield the hydroxyl hydrogen. What does that mean? It means it's going to shift it downfield or left. And so hydrogens and carboxylic acids can have some of the most downfield absorbances around 10.5 to 12 ppm. That's what we want to think about when we're looking at these answer choices. All right. We're looking for D-shield hydrogen peak for the hydroxyl hydrogen, and that's going to shift it downfield or left. And the answer that corresponds to that for 13 is going to be A. A down shielded hydrogen peak for the hydroxyl hydrogen shifted left. 14, the coupling constant J is blank. A says the value of N plus 1 when determining splitting in NMR spectra. B says measured in parts per million. C says corrected for by calibration with TMS. And D says a measure of the degree of splitting caused by other atoms in the molecule. Now, the coupling constant is a measure, is, is a measured of the degree of splitting introduced by other atoms in a molecule and is the frequency of the distance between subpeaks. All right. So that's going to align exactly with answer choice D. Now, if you look at answer choice B, measured in ppm, uh, all right, that's not true. It's measured in hertz. All right. The coupling constant is independent of the value of N1 of N plus 1. And also, it's not changed by the calibration of TMS, which is why A and B are also incorrect. 14 is D. All right, the coupling constant is a measure of the degree of splitting caused by other atoms in the molecule. 15 says the IR spectrum of a fully protonated amino acid would likely contain which of the following peaks? All right, a sharp peak at 1750, a sharp peak at 3300 wave numbers, or a broad peak at 3300 wave numbers. Now, amino acids in their fully protonated form contain all three of the peaks that should be memorized for testing. They're going to have CO, NH, and OH. Now, while statements 1 and 2 correctly give the peaks for the carbonyl bond, all right, sharp peak at 1750, and the NH bond, sharp peak at 3300 wave numbers, the peak for the OH bond is in the wrong place. So in a carboxylic acid, the carbonyl bond withdraws electron density from the OH bond, shifting the absorption frequency down to 3000 wave numbers. And so the only correct statements are going to be 1 and 2, not 3. All right, so 15 is going to be B. And with that, we've completed the practice problem set that relates to our spectroscopy lesson. I really hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck. Happy studying. Have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.